Welcome to the simplicity of the gospel brought to you by the Pegwell Community Church of Christ Church in Barbados. Number one, the Pegwell Community Church is a church that's making it difficult for you to go to hell. I'm making it difficult from this pulpit for you to go to hell. If you go to hell, it's your choice. Secondly, the simplicity of the gospel is a presentation by this church. You can go on YouTube and you can find us on the Pegwell Community Church of Barbados. The last time I checked, we have 515 videos there on lots of subjects you could go there and get some and you could share you could share with uh with your friends and loved ones we want to get the gospel of jesus christ oh amen so this morning i want to talk to you about uh handling the the the, the challenges in the christian life and like i said we are not handling it well at all some people are resorting to suicide there are others who are resorting to drugs some are backsliding, some are in depression, with everything else that's associated with depression, and we're having a real, real hard time. When you think about the difficulties of life, you think about people who are just stumbling around and floundering, people who are limping and just plodding on and seem to have no particular direction in which to go. This morning, I want to tell you that there's an answer. I want to tell you that there's an answer. There's so many things that we have to deal with nationally and internationally. We have to, have, we de we're dealing with problems like, like, like climate change. Climate change, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Climate change, wars and rumors of wars. We're dealing with problems with water. Not only is, is there water shortage, but there's water contamination. You're hearing about human rights violations and global health issues and, and global, global poverty. We're hearing about children who have poor access to, to health care and to education and, and to safety. And, and we're hearing about uh, a shortage of food and, and all sorts of things we're hearing about these days. But you know, I want to tell you that the Bible is the answer. The Lord has given us the assurance that things are going to come. And if the Lord says that, we know that they're going to come. Take, for example, the Bible said, weeping might endure for our night. I like the second part of all these verses. So weeping will come. As Christians, we live in a world, a fallen world. The same thing that happens to the world is going to happen to us. So weeping might endure for a night, but what? But joy comes in the morning. Let's look forward to the joy. Don't let's murmur and groan and complain about the weeping. But let's look forward to the joy. Listen to this one. If you suffer with me, if you suffer with me, you shall reign with me. The second part of these verses are always very interesting. So the suffering is going to come. If somebody told you that when you come to know the Lord that your troubles are all over, everything is going to be hunky-dory, they told you a lie. You are living in la-la land if you think that that's going to happen. No, it is not going to happen. The Lord said to us that in these end times that we've got to suffer. Listen to this. First Peter chapter 4 and 1. I have a lot to say. I'm going to be going real fast. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Christ suffered for us in the flesh, you remember? So you've got to arm yourself likewise with the same mind. Just like Christ suffered, you are going to suffer as well. What are you going to do? Resort to cutting the flesh? What are you going to do? Resort to hanging yourself up with a, with, with a rope? What are you going to do? You're going to backslide and say, conk me out, conk me out, oh, conk me out. Ch church is not for me any longer. Is that how you're going to handle it? I'm here this morning to show you how to handle it. For the Bible says, for as much then as Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. I can stop there, but the last part is so important. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. As soon as you cease from sin, you're not going the direction you were going in before, you're going to begin to suffer. Maybe you were one of those who were just naked and go to parties or probably ended up at, at garrison or whatever. And the day that you stop doing that, you're going to be under pressure. So you've got to arm yourself to suffer. Suffering is like, suffering in the Christian life, like I always say, is like water and wet. It's, it, 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 the two go together. 
It's like a horse and a carriage. Water, wet, wet, water, you're going to see them together. Look at this one. Psalm 34, verse 19. I'm at this point trying to tell you that the difficulties you're going through is nothing new. It's nothing strange. And if you think that you're going to live this life without, you are going to be disappointed. Psalm 34, verse 19 says this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Let's look at that. How many? Many. If it was just one or two troubles, you, 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 you'll be happy. But the Bible says many, many, many are the afflictions of who? The wicked. So the hard things in life are for the wicked people. Talk to me, talk to me. No, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But I tell you the second part is interesting. Read the second part of the verse. But the Lord delivered them out of them all. Let me give you some more scripture. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. I'm trying to convince you from the word of God that the difficulties that you're going through are not always from the devil. They are not always self-inflicted. Sometimes it's the normal course of living. But the grace of God, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, we are called to eternal glory, after that you have suffered a while. Say that with me. So suffering is part of the bargain. After that you've suffered a while, this is what the Lord is going to do for you. He's going to make you perfect. Secondly, he's going to establish you. He's going to strengthen you. So tell me, how many of you want to be made perfect? How many of you want to be established? How many of you want to be strengthened? How many of you want to be settled? Those four things are going to come in, according to the verse. After you have suffered a while. Christians, you're going to go through some suffering. Listen to this. I like what Paul said to the Romans in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. He said, for I reckon. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time. Man, I hate to hear Christians complaining all the time and mourning and groaning. You can't come to church because of this. You can't come to church because of that. This is what he's saying this about me. And the most disgusting ones are the ones that put it on Facebook. Every time they write something, they're in a battle. You don't hear about the glory of God. You don't hear about the love of God. You hear things like, if, if God be for me, who could be against me? No weapon that is for me. Shut up. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. It tells me something about you. You're always in a battle. Why are you always in a battle? For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, no matter what you're going through now, it is not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us when Christ comes. You remember that we, we were talking for the last two weeks about uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present life. Why? Looking for the glorious appearing. It's going to be glorious. Somebody said, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It will be worth it all when we see him. One glimpse, one glimpse of his dear face. All sorrows will erase. It does not matter what you are going through now. And I want you to think of the end. We are looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. We are going to appear with him in glory. It is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. I, 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 cannot, I cannot imagine what it's going to be. The Bible talks about an abundant entry being ministered unto us who are saved. An abundant entry into the kingdom of God. You can imagine all the orchestra. And when you die and you get at the pearly gates and all of a sudden the orchestra of heaven starts to play and the angels are lined up one side, the other side and, and you're walking on streets of pure gold and Jesus himself comes to escort you into the presence of the Father. Could you imagine that? What's God, that what it's going to be like? You're going to think back and you're going to say, I'm glad that she talked my name. I'm glad that they pulled me down. I'm glad that this happened. I'm glad that that happened because look at me now. Look at me now. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be wonderful. I'm requesting early o'clock, unless the Lord can do better. <laughs> That's a funny thing to say. But I'm requesting organ music. I love the organ. Wait, that up there. 
but it's going to be good. Am I making a point that you're going to be glad that you suffered? So why don't, why don't you stop quarreling now? Let me give you one more scripture. This one said, I, I like Romans 8.18, you know. Romans 8.18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared. Now look at, look at Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. He said, for the light afflictions that you're going through. Emphasis here is light. For the light, for our light affliction, no matter what you're going through now, it is light compared to when you get home with the Lord. You know, take that down for a little bit. Let me give you a story here because I hope you know that presentation has to do with being comical and stories. But there was this, there was this uh, man and his wife who went to Africa, spent many, many years, suffered a lot. Never achieved so much, but he won a lot of souls to the Lord. He has a name, but I don't remember it. And when he was coming back home, he happened to come back home on the same ship as one of the American presidents. And when they, got, when, they, when they pulled up at the harbor and the American president got off, there was all this fanfare, welcome, banter, all, all sorts of stuff, marching band and all that. And these two people who had given themselves for the Lord is somewhere in the background. And after all this fuss had subsided, the man looked at his wife and said, Look at us. We spent all our lives winning souls. We got, we got malaria. We drank dirty water. We eat rats and mice. But we won souls for the Lord. And not one person is here to welcome us home. Not one. And God intervened at the same time and said to the man, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. You can imagine what he's going to get when he gets home. I want you guys to stop fighting. Stop complaining. Stop murmuring. Understand that difficulties is part of the journey. Huh? This one here says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction, I don't care what you do me as a pastor. You could talk my name. You could not pay an offering. I don't care. I don't care. I raise my hand with scouts. How many fingers did I put up? Two or one? How many scouts? How, how many fingers did I put up? Three? These three? Because someone wanna put not one when I'm driving. <laughs> I do not care. You could talk my name. You could scandalize me. I don't give a hope what you do. Because the light affliction here in this life. It's not worthy to be compared of that abundant entry that's going to be ministered unto me. When they have red carpet events in America and other places, those red carpet events are just fantabulous, spectacular. And we look at them with, oh, that's going to be nothing when we get to heaven. But you're going to have to suffer a while first. You're going to have to suffer a while first. For only the affliction of riches, but for a moment. Think of moment now. We're using words and opposites here in this text. It works for us. Our light afflictions work for us. A far more exceeding and eternal. Compare eternal with moment. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There's so much glory waiting for the child of God. And you don't come back to church because somebody tell you that you hand by, hand by want cleaning. And you don't come back to church. Give me a break. People talk my name all the time. I, prepare, I, I pretend that I don't know. That's what you have to do. So who cares? It's part of the job. It is part of the job. Pastor, if you don't want that, go sell insurance. Go be a maid in somebody's house. Go be a nurse if you don't want that. That is part of the bargain. As a matter of fact, the Bible says... Be careful when all men speak well of you. How many of you know that's in the scripture? We're going to pull it up. Be careful. So when you come after service and tell me that was a good service, I've got to take that with a pinch of salt called next week. You're going to frown and go along through the door. Don't even speak to me. So you've got to be careful when you're taking the glory. You've got to understand that they come together. Look at this. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. For they did, they, 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 they did that to the false prophets as well. 
And you will always have people planted in the church to, to speak evil against the pastor. Well, so what? You're going to resign? God called you to do a job. No matter what hardship you go through as a pastor or as a member of the congregation, as a pastor of a Christian or a Christian, you've got to keep in your mind that when it is all said and done, man, there's an abundant entry in store for me. I like Romans 8, 18. I'm reading it for the third time. For our light affliction, anything you go through in this life is light. Light. Our light affliction. Can we read this in the New Living Translation? And then in, I don't think we have the passion. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. People try to spend four years preparing for the Olympics. They can't eat hamburgers, they can't eat this, they can't eat that. They got to have, they have a, a rugged training. But all the day when they get the goal, and they are on the center podium, and all the cameras are on them, and people around the world are cheering. You see, the four years was worth it. Worth it. And by the way, in Paul's time, because the Olympics started then, in Paul's time, what you got when you won was a wreath that we put on graves. A wreath that after four days, it is gone. And they spent four years of hard training to get a wreath. But it was worth it all. That's what they got in those days. We ain't going to get no wreath. The Bible said there's an abundant entry waiting for us. And then the Bible said that we have an inheritance in heaven. An inheritance stored up for us. And then there are seven different crowns that the Lord has promised. The crown of glory, the martyr's crown, the soul winner's crown. All of those are stored up for us. No wreath that is going to be messed up in four days' time. No, 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 no. So let me read verse 18 again in the Amplified. For I consider, from the standpoint of faith, that the sufferings of the present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory. Glory is one of the hardest words in the Bible to define. With the glory that is about to be revealed in us. So I think that I have made my first point. But let me give you one more verse. Philippians 1.29. I'm talking now from the word of God. I'm not like preachers who are divers. Some preachers are like divers. They hit off here and give you a verse. And you don't see them again for the next hour. Forget about the verse they're talking about. They talk about the newspaper. They talk about the Republicans and the congressmen and whatever. And that scripture that they read is the text. You never hear anything about it. Uh, I'm not doing that. I'm telling you at this point that I'm trying to convince you from the word of God that you are going to go through some hard times. But I'm not going to leave it there. Because that's a problem that we have in the church. That we leave things in the negative all the time. But look at this. Philippians 1.29. Let's all read this together. For, for unto you is given in the behalf of Christ... Not only to believe on him, but what? Oh, we are supposed to suffer for his sake? So how do you handle the suffering? Brethren, the suffering is coming because of a lot of things. Number one, there's a cycle of sin in your life. Sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent. I don't know how anybody could preach that wants to save, you always save. That's the Baptist doctrine which is so erroneous. There's this cycle of sin. And because of that, we don't have the resistance. We don't have the resistance to resist the devil. Because Satan can't cast out Satan. And if you're in Satan's territory, how are you going to have victory? So we are having difficulties because of the cycle of sin in our life. Number two, we are having difficulty because of unconfessed sins. The Bible said in Proverbs 28, 13, I could be wrong. He that covereth his sin, finish it for me, shall not prosper, but he that confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercies. Right there. I learned that verse 40 years ago in Boston, Massachusetts in Bible school. Let's read it together. Let's read it. He, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Go ahead. But, but whoso confesseth and forsake. Confess alone is not good enough. Confess it and forsake it shall do what? Shall have mercy. If we don't do that, if we don't do that, we're going to continue in the cycle of sin 
our lives are going to be difficult, the devil is going to make a mess. Another problem that we have, why we are not victorious, is because of lukewarm Christianity. Jesus wrote a letter to a church in Philadelphia, in, in, in Laodicea. Jesus dictated through John. And he said to this church, and these seven churches represent seven stages in the history of the church. We are in the last stage now. And this church said, man, we are rich. We are increased with goods. Revelation chapter 3. We are rich. This is what the church is saying, like the Roman Catholic church is saying today. We are rich. And the Mormon church, they have so much money. And increased with goods. We don't have need of anything. You have some people in church sit down in front of you with the same attitude. You see, the Leo, this, this same church in that country, they had just this, they developed a, a, a salve for people with bad eyes and people who are blind. And it was working, and the country was making a lot of money. So they weren't suffering like us. So the Lord said to this church, Is this, is this the church at Laodicea? He said to this church, This is why we have the problems, because I'm going to show you how to handle the problems today. I know your works, he said to this church, that you are neither cold nor hot. How about you? If the Lord wrote that to us, will he be telling the truth? How many of you consider yourself to be hot? How many of you consider yourself to be, to be uh, cool? The Lord said, I don't want your heart. I prefer, no, I don't want you. I prefer that you be either hot or cool. So because you are lukewarm, you can't win victory over the devil with a lukewarm attitude. Because you are lukewarm, the Lord said, I, you are lukewarm and you are not hot or cold. I will vomit you out of my mouth. When I get there, I always say, every time I preach, that God has a good stomach. He's God. And if he can vomit you out, you got to be bad. If God with a good stomach is going to vomit you out, you got to be bad. You're in a bad, bad, bad state. And why is going to vomit you out? Because you're neither cold nor hot. You're lukewarm. You're halfway in the church. One foot in, one foot out. That's dangerous. When Eutychus was like that perch in a window, when you're in a window, when you're sitting in the window, the window cell, party you out and party in. Paul preached past midnight. Eutychus fell asleep. And like most things, when you fall, you don't fall into the church. You usually fall out. And Eutychus fell out through the window, three stories up. And he died. Paul had to come down and restore him. We don't want to be like that. The Lord said, because you're lukewarm. The church today is lukewarm. You can't tell anybody anything. You can't motivate or encourage with anybody. This week we are dealing with some strange things that the Lord said and some strange things like he did. Like calling Herod a fox. Or like telling the scribes and the Pharisees, you're like whited tombs. You're, you're nice on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. And the Lord said some strange things. The Lord went into the church and turned over the tables with the money changers. They have more money changers in the church these days than anything else. You can't really encourage people anywhere. I can't encourage you. I, I, I'm amazed at the messages that you hear on Sunday mornings and say that you enjoy them. But when Sunday night comes, only half, half of you turn back up. I don't understand that. Maybe somebody should explain that to me. When I was coming up in church, we didn't do that. You got a good service on Sunday morning, everybody coming back the night, even if they don't come through the week. But they came back. But anyhow, let me bypass that and say to you, lukewarm Christianity is a problem. Then there's some other things that cause us to go through difficulties. Unemployment, financial difficulties. Sometimes there's a reduced income in the house. Somebody died or somebody lost a job. Or some man pack his bundles and, and go and leave you with the five children and, and no money is coming in. Uh, they have problems. All of these things are happening today. Uh, there are negative uh, things happening in the family. Families are falling apart. And then there's frustration and anger. There's some things that are causing frustration and anger. I'm showing you at this point the things that are causing you to have a hard time in the Christian life. Loneliness. Depression. Loss of a loved one. Addiction or a relapse. All of these things are causing problems. And I could give you 250 different things that are causing problems right in the church and in the world. And we got to live through them, brethren, so how are we going to handle them? Addiction, relapse, constant threat of violence. You can't go to a party now and enjoy yourself because some fool is going to turn up with a gun. 
Can I go to Kensington now and enjoy some cricket? Like we did yesteryear? Because some fool will turn up with a gun. And then there's confusion in the Christian realm. I'm talking about what is making life so difficult for us now. Confusion in the Christian realm. But the Lord tells us about that. Let me give you some scripture. And then I'm going to finally stop as I tell you about how you can handle today's difficulties the biblical way. In Matthew 24, 6, the Lord says we're going to hear about wars and rumors of wars. Are you with me? Anybody getting anything out of what I'm saying so far? Wars and rumors of wars. But see that you be not alarmed. See that you be not troubled. Because if you are, that's going to cause confusion. I am not one of those persons who say the Lord tell me this and the Lord tell me that. As a matter of fact, I hate to hear preachers keep saying that all the time. But the Lord, I was sitting on my toilet bowl and the Lord said to me, don't use toilet paper today, I'll use some leaves. Every preacher these days, the Lord tell me this. You know, the Lord don't tell me that so. I hear preachers saying all the time, the Lord told me this, the Lord told me, the Lord doesn't tell me. I, I sometimes ask, the Lord, man, you're green. How come you talking to everybody and say, not talking to me? The Lord told me not to go down to the oysters this morning, to go up to Sam Lawrence Castle. How come the Lord doesn't tell me that kind of stuff? You know what the Lord told me? The Lord told me, give 66 books, preach them. I have given you a whole library, 66 books. The Bible said that the Lord has in these days finally spoken to us by his son. And in the book of Peter, he says that the Lord has given us a more sure word of prophecy. That is the Bible. I listened to Jack Van MP. He was over 80 years old. Very good preacher, end time preacher. He got sick, real, real sick, and he recovered. He recovered and he took back his program called Jack Van Impey Speaks. I think that's what it's called. And on that program, he said the Lord told him that he has to reach in a new way every nation under the sun. He started to send out a few booklets and then he died. How are you going to die without doing what the Lord tells you to do? So when I hear these people come and tell me the Lord tells me this and the Lord tells me that, you speak to the hand. You're not talking to me. If you're going to read me a portion of scripture and say that's what the Lord says, I'm happy with that. The Lord tells you. I don't even. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you be not alarmed. Don't get alarmed when these things happen, otherwise it can trigger some depression or discouragement or something. Matthew 24, same 36. About that day and that hour, no one knows. So don't worry about the rapture. I was talking, I, I, I know where I was going there. The, the, the Lord, if, if I said the Lord ever said anything to me, it is what he said in Luke chapter 8 and verse 50, I think it is. He said to me personally, be not afraid, only believe. Be not afraid, only believe. And that has been what I've been doing for the last two, three, four weeks. Because you can walk around in despair. You can walk around discouraged. You can walk around not knowing your head from your tail. But the Lord said, don't worry about these things. Wars and rumors of wars, don't worry about these things. 24, 36, don't worry. I, I, I'm in Matthew, sorry, Matthew 24, 36. Don't, don't worry about when I'm going to come because even the angels don't know. Because suddenly we think that we should worry about things because they're spiritual, because they're scriptural. No, the Lord doesn't want us to worry. He says in Matthew, take no thought which means don't worry about even what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or what you're going to wear. The Lord said, don't worry about those. Then the Lord says, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, begin at verse 13. These are things that can make you worry. Give you a hard life. Such are false apostles. So if they're false apostles, they're real apostles. Do you know the difference? You, you can worry about this all your life. As a child of God, as a preacher, you can be worried about this. Are such a false apostles then they're deceitful workers you don't have to tell me that because we have some deceitful workers they talk behind your back and they spread your name elsewhere as soon as you don't preach the going telephone and call people but you hear what the pastor say well if the pastor's reading he's always right when he's reading when he's reading scripture the pastor that's reading scripture is always right well when he, when he goes off into something else and talks different things he could be wrong but scripture he's always right Deceitful workers transforming themselves. Notice nobody didn't set them. 
They're transforming themselves as the apostles of Christ. So nowadays nobody don't want to be called pastor. You either got to be an apostle, a prophet, a doctor, a chief executive officer, or something. What's wrong with pastor? Or for me, you could call me, hey, yo. That's good enough for me. I ain't got a problem with that. False workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Transforming themselves. Another place the Bible speaks about you, church. You have that woman there called Je that calls herself a, a prophet, Jezebel. That's the one the church is. She calls herself. Nobody didn't appoint her. She calls herself a prophet. Notwithstand that a few things against you. Because you permit that woman, Jezebel, you permit her. Who calls herself a prophetess? Everybody wants fancy names. What's wrong with being a pastor? I have somebody trying to persuade me for the last two months that I ought to be a presiding bishop. Presiding bishop over who? You have to have some people under you that you preside over. You think I just walk around looking for names? I'm not trying to get the social ladder. You went up there already, coming back, don't know. I'm not looking to be, to be, I'm not looking to be elevated. So I'm at the point where we are talking about deceitful workers in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm giving you things that will cause you problems. And notice I'm talking about some things this morning that you're not accustomed to hearing. Because you're accustomed to John 3, 16, and that's all. And the last 20 years, all you've been hearing is John 3, 16. There's scriptures like these that you've got to know. That they're false apostles so that when they have service tonight and you get in your car and you run downtown because you hear somebody come from America, a prophet come from America, you better be careful that they're not false apostles. You've got to be careful that they're not deceitful workers who transform themselves into the apostles of Christ by wearing a thousand dollar suit and having a big attached case and you get the impression that there's a man of God. Oh yeah? If you read Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, around verse 27, you will see who God calls into ministry. You wouldn't call them. Look at it. You wouldn't call them. The Bible says, look around and see, not many mighty are called. Not many noble. I wanted to come up so, so that you think that somebody that's driving a big car and living in a big house, God, be a person of God. That's a man of God. Man of God what? The Lord say, you're just like white as sepulchers outside the clean, outside the clean, but inside the full of dead men's bones. Look what the Lord says. Let me show you. I'm at this point here to show you that I don't want you to suffer from any inferiority complex. Nobody's better than you. The Lord said, I like to use the ones that all the wear down there. Let's read it. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, how many people with their secular degrees are pastoring churches? How many of them come to church in the first place? No. That how not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty... God didn't look for people that are authoritative. Not many noble. The Lord's not looking for people in the nobility. He's not looking for people from over in the Queen's Palace and from uh, Obama's house and all that. Uh, uh, to bring to, but, but look what the Lord has chosen. I've missed the verse. I think I've missed verse 27. Verse 27. But God has chosen. If you are in this category, you are chosen of God. You all have to run down to every time you hear somebody coming from a big church up in Maryland. You know, big church can have false apostles, false teachers, false prophets. And these are things that get us worked up. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He ain't looking for the wise. And the Lord has chosen the weak things of the world. He ain't going to be all that strong. If you're weak, you're a good candidate for the Lord to select you. God has chosen the weak things of the world. But it gets worse. It gets all better. How you choose to look at it? Verse 28. And God has chosen the base. You know what base means? Have you heard about the basement? Where the basement is? All down at the bottom? Okay. Well, God has chosen the base things of the world and the things that are despised. Those have God chosen. And the things that are not, you know when something is not? Like you don't even exist. You get people come out to church because they got a degree and want to make you feel like you're some sort of idiot or something. Why well, make you feel like you're some sort of nincompoop? No, no, no. Your, your, your secular degree might disqualify you from working for the Lord. Your secular degree could disqualify you from working for the Lord. Because the Lord chose the best things and the things which are despised and the things that are not 
to bring to nothing the things that think they're something. Why? Why does he do that? Look at the next verse. Verse 29. Why has he done that? That no flesh. You can't say he went to UV and they passed with a number one. Or whatever you call them. First class. God not interested in you. You know, your first class, go work at the bank. God is not looking for that type of person in the kingdom of God. So let me go back and read from verse 26. And let me read it in the New Living Translation so that you leave here today with a full knowledge that you are no nincompoop. You are not, you are not inferior to anybody in church. Don't let them intimidate you when they come in church. As a matter of fact, the higher they are in the natural, the lower they are in the sight of God. Let's read that and see if I'm telling lies. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in this world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those that think they are. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who think they are powerful. Verse 28, God chose, God chose despise, God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used those things to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one could ever boast in the presence of God. I'm lifting you up from where you think you are. Don't be discouraged and depressed and disappointed and disgusted because people make you feel that you are nothing. I could, I could preach in the Queen's Palace. Well, she ain't about here now, but I could preach in the King's Palace. Wait, if I put a Bible in my hand, I'll preach. You don't have to give me any notes. Lots of you sitting in front of me should be like that. You've been here long enough. But you can't. And when the Lord said that you should be eating meat, you're still about here crying to me for, I nearly said bubbies, but you can't say that in the pulpit. You're still about here crying to me for breast. You want breast milk. And you've been here 20 years, giving trouble talking people's name, all kind of stuff. And when we need you to do something for the Lord, you can't because you don't spend time with the Lord getting to know him. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Say all myself if you're all frightened. I say all myself. We have such a dearth for the word of God in the pulpits these days. And I don't want to offend the pastor here, but the worst is in America. You got the worst preaching out of America, all kinds of false doctrines. And because they have money to go on television or whatever, they're, they're, they're discombobulating the population. Go into Africa and see what God is doing. Go into Asia and see what God is doing. You don't even have to go so far. Go down to South America and see what God is doing. And what God is doing in those three continents, you're not seeing anywhere across America. Because they think that they're God's gifts to the world. They know everything. This is 2024. They come up with some saying. It was no more in 2024 or whatever. 2025, they're going to come up with something that's that like rhyme with 25. Because them is God's mouthpiece. And when they come down here, they turn you all foolish. Somebody just sent me a, um, a video. A video. If it was not a video, I would not have believed. Of a preacher who's African. And I'm going to be very nice with this call. This is Sunday morning. Who, who has to excrete air in your face from his rear so that you'll get healed. You can't understand what I'm saying. The Belgian translation is he got a fart in your face for you to be healed. Anybody, did anybody see that? But that's who one is run behind. Tell me who one is run behind. It also, the, the section also said that some people are, are canning some of it for later use. In a container, canning some of it for later use. You, you didn't say it. I, my phone is right here. Otherwise, I can show you. Brother, I'm teaching, huh? How many know I'm teaching? I'm, te I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to be teaching to keep you all away from certain people. Don't no, pray for me now. Pray for yourself. Don't no, pray for me. I don't need prayer right now. I need to be bold. I think more pastors need. This time, the church is going through a turbulent time, and the pastors need to stay in their pulpit and guide the church in the way it should go. Get rid of the youth department, the women's department, all those women that are doing your work, pastor. You are the pilot, and when the plane is going through turbulence, the pilot does not hand over the plane to the air hostesses or whatever. He gets in there. He does the work. The church is going through a lot of turbulence since COVID, and the person that is supposed to be in the pulpit is the pastor, but the pastors are too lazy 
and they get too much money and they have too many people helping them to do the work that they ought to do. Those same people that at the end of the year, you get all your money and give those pastors all sorts of gifts. And the people in the church who are doing the work don't even get a Coke. Don't even get a Coke. When last did you see a bishop get something? A dare for the bishop. A dare for the evangelist. A dare for the Sunday school teachers. When last did you see any of them get something? Why should the pastor get all that? You pay him a salary, let him go and buy, let him or her go buy what they need. Like the teacher got to go, the police got to go. Let the pastor go face the supermarket, but pay him the salary. Huh? Let him go face like anybody else. This is one of these churches here that not waiting on your money. Not that you have money. But I'm not waiting on your money. I'm teaching. And something you teach by lifestyle. Not only from the public, but you teach by lifestyle. And we got to be careful. All these things are causing problems. Churches are falling apart. Scandals and all kind of stuff. So in the next 15 minutes, let me show you. Let me show you what is the answer to today's problems. It amazes me. That God who is always has given us foolproof solutions for everything that we need. But we decide to throw them out through the window and get our own. In the book of, in the word of God, we have the answer for every problem. It can't fail. It cannot fail. But we decide we're going to pull it out through the window. Let me tell you, give you three verses that shows you that God is not a liar. Because the verses that I'm going to give you after that, they will work. And if you apply them, you don't have to be walking around pulling up your hair. You don't have to be walking around, walking around, disappointed and disgusted and quarreling and murmuring. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Colossians that we should do everything, everything, all things, without murmuring and complaining. Murmuring is muttering under your breath. The boy might not be able to hear you, but it's still there. We should do all things without murmuring and complaining. People of God, I'm talking to you now, I'm forgetting the world. The world doesn't have the Bible, so they will use all kinds of solutions to get answers. You can't blame them. But no, we, we are different. We are different. God has given us his word. So Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19 tells us something that should give us some confidence when we look at the word of God and we don't see why we should believe it. Because when you look at the Beatitudes, you don't see why you should believe them. When I look at the Beatitudes, it don't make no sense to me. Blessed are the poor, for they should inherit the earth. Oh, go ask the rich people around the world if, they, if they're inherited by poverty. The Lord said, blessed are the merciful, for they should obtain mercy. Lord, you're joking or something? So everything he tells us in the Beatitude doesn't seem to work. But because he's God, you believe it and it works. But we'll get back to that another thing. Look what the Bible says. God is not a man that he should lie. You are not the first person that God is going to lie to. He ain't going to lie at all. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. The word repent means to change your mind. God never changes his mind. Never. If God changed his mind, it means that he made a mistake in the first place. It means that he didn't know what he was saying. It means that he didn't put all facts together before he come to that conclusion. And our God is not like that. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should change his mind. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? In other words, will God open his mouth and say something and then don't do it? No, not the God that we serve. So he's given a solution to the problems that you're going through. Let me give you two more scriptures though. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God cannot lie. Let me give you one more. Hebrews 6 and 18. When God wants to swear, like you swear before the justice of the peace, you swear by somebody higher. When God did not have anybody to swear by anybody higher, he swore by himself. That by, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, I don't have to go any further. It's impossible for God to lie. We have a hand up if you understand that God can't lie. All right, those of you who can't, didn't understand, you'll understand later. So knowing that God can't lie, listen to what he says as the answers to some of our problems. Number one, Psalm 119, 105. You're going in the wrong direction. It's because you choose to. Thy word, the word. 
All the answers to all problems are found in the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Why are you walking in darkness? And a light unto my path. Why are you going down the wrong path? It's because you're not paying heed to the word of God. Can I hear amen if you believe that? Amen. Let me give you some more. James 1.22. The reason you have difficulties is because you discard the word of God. You don't care what God says. But be ye doers of the word. Not preachers of the word. Or memorizers of the word. Or, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. That is a major problem in the church. People hear but they don't do. You're going to have difficulties, man. Because whenever you violate the word of God, you're going to have difficulties. Whenever. Be ye doers of the word. Hear what the word says. Forgive. Pastor, you know what she do to me. So what? You want to go to heaven? You want the abundant entry into the kingdom of God? You want to live in one of those mansions? You want to walk a street of go? I don't care what she did to you. It is in your interest that you forgive. You got to obey the word if you get, want to get rid of some of the problems in life. The Lord said, put away anger, bitterness. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, the Lord says, put away some things that if you don't put away, you're not going to see his face. But who cares about that? Hebrews 12, 4, they follow up peace with all men. Do you follow up peace? The first word is follow, which means that peace like is always trying to get away from you. And you've got to keep following after it all the time. Follow peace with who? Just your family? With all men. And what else you should follow? Come on, which, what else you should follow? Why? Read, why? Without which? No man should see the Lord. So who cares about falling peace? If I see, I see. If I see, I see. Oh yeah? You think when you don't see the Lord that you're going to a party at, at Sam Lord's? If I don't see him, if I miss it, so well. You're going to pee your pants. Every day. If you miss the rapture. Because it's not a day at Sam Lord's. It's fire and brimstone. It's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there are things that the scripture tells us to do. And we are burdened. Let me tell you something. Unforgiveness is such a burden. Bitterness is such a burden. The Bible talks about root of bitterness. Because you tell me, Pastor, I'm bitter. That's true. You know where root is? Where, where, where you find the root? Under the surface. So the Bible speaks about root of bitterness. Your bitterness is not easily seen because you're going to come and laugh in my face. <laughs> Pastor, that was a good message this morning. <laughs> but down by the root. Down by the root. We're going to say root of all bitterness. The Bible said the root of bitterness. I'm losing some volume up here. I don't have any volume. The root of bitterness will spring up. The root of bitterness will spring up. Look at what it says here. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness. He didn't say branch of bitterness or fruit of bitterness, but the root. You can't see when somebody's bitter. They smile with you the same way. Lest the root of bitterness springing up trouble you, but it doesn't only trouble you. Bitterness don't only cause you a problem. Bitterness causes all the people around you. Look, it's right there. And thereby many are defiled because of your bitterness. You see why we're going through hardship? Because we're hearing the word of God, but we're not doing it. Uh, Luke eleven twenty eight, But he said, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. And I am going to stop there with these other verses that I have. Because I'm telling you, number one, that hardship is a bargain for you. Number two, you got to take your eyes off the, off the hardship. You got to maneuver the situation. You got to fight, like Paul said. You got to struggle. You got to contend. Keep it in the back of your mind that it will be worth it all when you see Jesus. Keep it in the back of your mind that the trials that you're going through now are just light affliction. The word affliction means hardship. Difficulty. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the hardships, the difficulties. Question. What's the hardship that you're going through now? Your marriage? You remember your mother to tell you, watch out when you plan the wedding? 
You remember? You don't want to hear she's she too old. I love he. He tall, dark, and handsome. Yeah? I love he. Pastor, I love, mommy, I love he. Like Samson. Samson found a woman, and his father and mother said to him, Didn't find, didn't anybody else among Israel that you could find to that you could find to marry? You know what this rude man tell him, mother? I love she gets you for me. I love her. I love her. Get her for me. And I tell you, he started going down. When the enemy started coming, huh? Samson, the Philistines are upon you. She had already cut his hair. She had already done a lot of wickedness. I say that to say, your mother tell you that you should watch out when you're trying to get married. She was not in love with that man that you want to get married so she could see all the faults. You don't see nothing. If your mother tell you, watch out, she's not going to tell you don't get married because she can't tell you that. But she's going to tell you watch out. There's some red flags. You don't want the red flags. You want to do what you want to do. So now the problems come in the marriage. You come into the pastor. Pastor, is there any way you could disannul this marriage? No, we can't. Pastor, what you can do with this marriage? Nothing. We can do nothing. Listen to the word of God. Where are you having difficulties? On the job? I have no doubt. With that sort of spirit that you have. Last week we were talking about, about Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. The Bible said, and then was found a pleasant spirit. But you go to work, you grumpy. Your face like a saxophone. And the older you get, it looking more like an accordion with the creases. And you want to stand in front of somebody's office. And this, 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 that's the facial. That's, that's what you want to do. And you expect you can get promotion. You can have problems on the job. Like so sometimes these things are self-inflicted. And I go and through such hardships. Stop and check yourself. I go and through such difficulties. You bring the difficulties on yourself sometimes. You save so you can't talk to nobody else. Everybody saw all the unsafe people in the lunchroom eating their lunch. And you go on the toilet. Call you different. Listen, the Lord said, occupy till I come. Which means live a normal life till I come back. Well, you can't eat at the lunch, at the lunch table and let, let, let the way you eat say to the people that ain't saved. I think I can get saved. I like how she's eat. You know, she don't snap. Huh? Why you all got to be so different? Why you got to be so different? Even though got some holy ones in here that can't even smile. i sorry for them. Sorry, real sorry. Listen, enjoy yourself here. Laugh when you can laugh. Smile when you can smile. You understand? Because someday it will come when those muscles in your face will lock off. Have you ever heard about lock? Uh, the, what do you call it again? Lock jaw. You ever heard about them? So when the Lord tell you, when the Lord give you the opportunity to smile, smile here. The Bible said a merry heart do a fair like a medicine, you know. If you could smile sometimes, you could put away some of them vicks and fences and all sorts of things that you're taking. Because that's what the Lord said. I really sorry. And not only sorry, but I pity those who come to church and they can't smile in the presence of God. It's a bad example to other people who come in. It's a rotten example to other people because people come through the doors watching you, you know. They're watching you. You are the example. Let your light so shine before men. But you might not want to laugh, but you remember, somebody's watching me. Somebody, I don't have a pleasant spirit. What was the word that came before spirit when we did it on Thursday night? Excellent spirit. We talk about excellent. None of y'all weren't here when we talk about excellence. God expects excellence in the church. And the, the Proverbs 31 woman was a woman with an excellent spirit. Esther was a woman with an excellent spirit. Then we had some other people. Who else we dealt with? We dealt with Daniel. Who was promoted in the land because he had an excellent spirit. You mean, although I talk about that, you come to church this morning again, you can't have an excellent spirit this morning. Even for a change while you're in church for the two hours that you're here. And when you go back home, if you want to bend up your face again, do it when you get home. But you mean, even in church right now, you can't have an excellent spirit. All That's why I tell you about hearing the word, past time, right? That's why I tell you about hearing the word and not doing it. You hear the word and you don't do it. And then you blame people when there's lack of promotion in the church. Lack of promotion in the job, whatever the case may be. So my text I didn't give you for the morning. This is my text. Take this back home. John 16, 33. And then we're going to sing a song and we're going home happy in the Lord. The Bible tells us to praise the Lord and be merry and be joyful and rejoice in the Lord. That is what we're going to do. Amen. I'm so glad that God gave me eyelids. 
and I'm glad that my eyelids work. Because when I don't want to see something, I use my eyelids. I shut my eyes. Because nobody's going to turn me off from serving God. And there's some bad-spirited people in church. How many of you know there are bad-spirited people in the church? I know, because you tell me about them all the time. You know what I mean? Bad-spirited people in the church. Cl close your eyes and serve your God. Because times are difficult, but you could overcome. This is my text here this morning. Jesus said, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. The second part is what I want. In the world you're going to have what? Did we not just say that Jesus is not a liar? He's not a liar, right? And he said, in what? In the world what? In the world you will have what? Tribulation. Stop complaining about it. Learn to maneuver. Learn to apply the word. But, you know, but changes the first part of the verse many times. When you see but, it usually changes the first part of the verse. But, I was going to cough she and she faced, but somebody held my hands. I was going to cough she and she faced, but somebody held my hands. The but changes the first part. I'm serious, I'm serious. Do, do, those of you who do English, check it out. Okay? In the world, you're going to have tribulation, but walk around with a long face and quarrel with everybody and be depressed and discouraged and go to, go to cars and see how much rope you can buy. And, you know? Because I'm going through difficulties. Because I'm going through some hard places. I am sorry for you. You are disobedient to the word of God and you're going to stay where you are for a long, long, long time. But no, the Lord said you're going through troubles, but be of good cheer. Why? I have overcome the world. Another text says, because I overcome, finish it, you also will overcome. So you'll do what this word said, be of good cheer. Be joyful. Be happy. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord as you stand. We're going to sing a song. Let's all stand. We're going to sing. If you do not have a local assembly, Feel free to join us for an exhilarating time of worship. Our services are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Sunday evening, healing and deliverance at 6.30 p.m. Join us in prayer on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. and for Bible study on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Bless fellowship and enjoy. The simplicity of the gospel.